Welcome to Keeping You in the Family with Dr. Margaret Aranda on the CAW 360 Network. Hi, good evening, and welcome to Keeping You in the Family. I'm Dr. Margaret Aranda, your host. Um, just for your listening pleasure, there are two ways to listen to tonight's program. One is through the main website at www.cawnation.com. That's C-A-W-N-A-T-I-O-N.com. Or you can find us also on YouTube in the channel Keeping You in the Family. And it would be great if you could please like and subscribe to our YouTube, our YouTube channel and all of CAW 360's uh, networks across uh, YouTube also for your daily dose of truth. Also, if you have a question for me tonight or a comment, please definitely feel free to call us in the studio. We're at area code 415-403. 2715. And tonight's show, we're going to be discussing insomnia and Pavlov. So uh, I hope that you find it interesting and, and informative and that you can also use it for a lot of practical reasons. So when we're talking about sleep, many patients with pain say, what is sleep? I don't even remember the last time I slept for eight hours. And most people in a lot of pain end up sleeping maybe every two hours at a time, every three hours, every five hours maybe. Um, most of the time I know they wake up in pain and that's what wakes them up. So we're going to be talking about all of that. But the most important thing about today's talk is the circadian rhythm. So we can see uh, that sleep is associated with day and night cycles. It revolves around the brain, uh, the pineal gland in the brain that helps regulate it. And all the little things that go into it, the circadian rhythm you see, we're surrounded by stress, depression, insomnia, uh, frustration, sleep, um, all different kinds of things, anxiety, sleepwear, the mattress, the person next to you feeling lonely, all these things are, it can be very complicated, but for most people you can see the big arrow there goes to pain. So I think you'll see some helpful information today and uh, it just has to do with awakening and sleeping. So uh, here we can see that awakening occurs in the nucleus Raffis and serotonin is a neurotransmitter that gets released for awakening. And then sleep involves the pineal gland in the brainstem and also the hormone melatonin. Now, melatonin is normally secreted by your brain every sunset. As soon as the light starts dimming, that's when the brain is triggered to go ahead and release the melatonin. So... That's really good to know because there's a built-in system that we can tap into. We can either decrease the awakening part of the brain or we can increase the sleeping part of the brain or both. So these mechanisms will be very useful when we get to talk about Pavlov also. Uh, just like diet revolved around your lifestyle, same with insomnia. Insomnia, insomnia can be related to your life cycle, cycle also. So if you travel from here to Europe, you're going to get jet lag. If your environment has a lot of busy noise in the background or your mattress is really bad, that's going to keep waking you up too. Um, if you have 
exams, if you're moving, you have a new job, going through a divorce or have a death in the family, all these things will keep your mind occupied. Uh, so part of the, the triggering that we're going to be using to trigger your brain to get used to going to sleep has to do with thinking patterns, also has to do with habits around bedtime. Uh, of course, smoking cigarettes will wake you up. So will caffeine, uh, coffee, soda before bed, alcohol. Alcohol is pretty notorious because it's, a, it's definitely a depressant. But what happens when you go to sleep on a glass or two of wine is that your liver will metabolize it. And it takes about four hours to cause your bloodstream levels of alcohol to go down to zero. When that happens, that's why you pop wide awake after drinking. So a lot of people can just stop drinking at bedtime, and then you'll start sleeping overnight. So medications can also keep you awake, um, and a lot of medications need to be taken a little bit earlier in the day so their awakening effect can wear off. A big cause of nighttime awakening is blue light. Blue light is emitted from your cell phone, your television, and it upsets the human circadian rhythm. So your cell phone is sending light impulses through your eyes to your brain that is a window to the brain. And if you have a spinal cord injury or a traumatic brain injury, that light will stimulate your central nervous system and work against you going to sleep. So you need to put away your cell phone, get it away from your head, um, turn it off overnight, and try not to put yourself to sleep by playing games on your cell phone because it's probably gonna keep you awake. And then a lot of other causes besides pain is, Central pain or pain that's 24-7 and intractable. A lot of patients in our country suffer with that. Stress and anxiety can cause insomnia too. We talked about the blue light. Um, and actually in 2011, the World Health Organization, who issued a statement that, that cell phones can lead to cancer. And some people think that if you're talking on the phone on your right side of your head all the time and you end up with a brain tumor on the right side that's tied to your cell phone. So a lot of people don't put the cell phone up to their ear. They're only using the speakerphone, keeping it as far away from their head as possible. And I think it's pretty serious that the World Health Organization came up with a statement like that that they have not retracted. Um, but I think also that common sense it tells us that maybe some of these radio frequencies aren't so great for our brain. And uh, having suffered a traumatic brain injury and recovered from it, I can tell you that I can feel the RF or the radio frequency coming from the bottom of the phone when people talk, and a lot of people can't feel it. And, and I know other people that feel different things like that too, or their watches don't work on them, things like that. They break watches. So... We know that also worrying about financial matters, about your pharmacy, whether it's going to fill your medication or whether your doctor is going to give you your same medications next month, those keep a lot of people up at night. And I'm very happy and relieved that the CDC and the FDA sort of did a flip-flop there and uh, let doctors know that, after all, we should not force taper patients off of opioids uh, because they may get intractable pain and suicide, and I think we knew that, most of us. So it's, it's good that people are coming around, and our government is going to try to help this population of patients that got ostracized. Uh, men are pretty, men over 50 are pretty um, likely to have benign prostatic hypertrophy, which inflames the prostate gland and gives them a sensation that they need to urinate. They end up going frequently in very small volumes. Uh, that, that can keep you up. A bad mattress can do the same thing too, or sleeping with your baby if you have a newborn. You know, kids in your bed it can be nice and cuddly while you're awake, but then when you go to sleep, they can smack you in the face and stuff. So, so it might not be a great idea for sleeping overnight. And probably the most worrisome condition, I think, to have at 
bedtime is obstructive sleep apnea. So we're just going to take a moment in a moment to talk about that. So how do you know if you're suffering from insomnia? Well, you don't feel re refreshed when you wake up. You have daytime fatigue and sleepiness. You make mistakes. You forget things. You have short-term memory loss. You get in bad moods easily. Mood changes. Bad, good, bad, good. Um, you may have a poor attention span, unable to concentrate. You may have a lack of energy for sure, and you may get tired out by simple things. It will definitely cause some anxiety and poor socialization. So if you're not going out and being around other people, you know, we know that that can make you tired if you're in a lot of pain and you're depressed and have anxiety, but it's probably going to help wear you out too in some good ways, assuming it's good company who's mostly positive. So socializing is a really important thing to have and, and to have around you for lots of other reasons besides just insomnia. So let's just talk about obstructive sleep apnea for a moment. Uh, mostly the wives know that their husbands snore. And the big component about this is that not only do you snore, but you hold your breath. And you can actually die in your sleep or die suddenly when you have this diagnosis. Normally when you lay down your tongue, the back of your tongue doesn't get in the way. And the in the top picture you see the... Uh, pink or lavender uh, dots of oxygen that go past the airway into the lungs. Oh, I'm sorry, that one's that one's the obstructed one. <laughs> the bottom one is a normal airway. You see the same color, bluey blue, and these ones are dark colored past the base of the tongue because it's not getting oxygen to the lungs. A lot of these people will uh, retain CO2 and have more CO2 in their blood gases, in their blood tests that we can do. Uh, but also looking at all the risks that obstructive sleep apnea can cause, um, we see that uh, besides snoring and being fatigued, um, on the next slide there, sometimes people actually fall asleep at their desk and uh, intellectually decline with age. Uh, it's also associated with obesity and diabetes, respiratory disorders, sl sleeping problems, of course, but high blood pressure, uh, heart uh, strokes. Uh, those are all very sort of m very bad morbidities. Those are, that's a high price to pay for having an obstructed airway. Um, but we can see, too, that drinking the alcohol, using your cell phone, eating pizza, getting heartburn from it, um, watching too much TV, smoking a cigarette, those things. If you're doing those kinds of things before it's bedtime, you are actually conditioning your body not to sleep. So this is sort of anti-Pavlovian there. It's, uh, it goes against the grain of what we're going to be teaching today. So conditioning and learned behavior was noted by Pavlov, who took dogs who were being fed a bowl of dog food, and he tracked how much saliva they made. So they would ring a bell, and the dog wouldn't produce any saliva but when they combined the bell with food you see the long tongue there the dog started salivating so eventually if he did this often enough just the bell with no food would cause the dog to salivate and this is the principle that we use to teach our bodies how to uh, sleep so uh, the Pavlovian sleep is going to be different for each individual. So the point is to not do the negative things. You may do well with a cup of hot green tea, with a warm bath, especially with Epsom salt in it, because those are magnesium and it works as a muscle relaxant. Uh, lavender or uh, some essential oils can definitely help. 
and also reading a book, sitting in a rocking chair, especially if you have arachnoiditis or a spinal cord injury can help move your cerebral spinal fluid around. So each person is different, but you can try to identify some things that are relaxing and incorporate them into a bedtime routine so that you do A, B, C, D, E. Then you go to bed at the last minute and you fall asleep. And, and some really key principles um, have to do with uh, traditional medical management of sleep disorders. I think most of the time doctors are prescribing benzos or something else. Um, and we have a question from Love It on YouTube who asks, what do you think about L-tryptophan for sleep and anxiety? And that can definitely help. And, and you know, different people have different effects of different medications and supplements. A lot of people do really well with melatonin and magnesium. And I am beginning to prefer the liposomal delivery system because it doesn't digest through your stomach. So they're little liposomes. So they're like uh, water-based in the inside. And their polarity is such that the lipid layer is on the outside. And so it can go through the gut really easily. And it's not damaged by gut enzymes uh, and, and acids. So... Melatonin as small as three to five milligrams. It's not exactly at bedtime, right? It's at sunset. And you can increase it to up to 25 milligrams a night. It's very rare that I find somebody that needs that much. Um, but you give it together with magnesium. And traditionally what happens is that the melatonin will put you to sleep and then it will wear off. But right at the time that it's starting to wear off, is where the magnesium is going to kick in to keep you asleep. So that's why I personally like to take these both together. Now, when you're talking about a pharmaceutical grade versus a supplement, it's very interesting. You wouldn't think it would be this way, but if you're in Australia or Europe, you need a prescription for melatonin. It's not even available over the counter. In America, we have a lot of supplements available over the counter, but you have to be very careful about them because the FDA is always busting companies, even recently, for selling things like melatonin with no melatonin in it. So be careful. Not every supplement has what it says it has in it. Um, I personally don't use benzodiazepines. I don't like prescribing them, especially together with opioids mostly because I don't think they help overall well-being as much as other things do. And also because your insurance company will send me letter after letter after letter telling me how much I'm killing you by doing that. And it's a really bad feeling to have as a doctor. So um, most of the people with a spinal cord injury actually get muscle spasm and I like to treat the muscle spasm from the source, which is the spinal cord. If we can relax the spinal cord and get it from uh, not triggering so many impulses, our patients stop spasming because we're curing it where the problem is. So I like to put a lot of thought into why somebody's not sleeping. And I'm really happy to report that melatonin and magnesium is a fantastic combination that has been working time after time. Um, the other thing, um, okay, so we have Crystal from YouTube asks, if benzos help for years and can't anymore, are there other medication substitutes? Absolutely. So depending on why you were put on it, and if we're talking about muscle spasm in particular, I like tizanidine. It uh, is for spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. I only give it if I see myoclonus or muscle jerking on the physical exam. The most common side effects are probably dry mouth and sedation or sleepiness. So what we do with a lot of our patients, they take one pill at bedtime. It lasts eight hours. They sleep five or six hours. They're happy. And the spouse is happy because they're not shaking the bed with spasms in the middle of the night, literally, or their foot isn't getting stuck in one position like a big, huge char Charlie horse. Um, otherwise, uh, non-benzos that are good for sleep are Ambien or Zolpidem. Five milligrams works for a lot of people. Uh, Zalpalon or Sonata is another one. Five milligrams works for a lot of people. Uh, Halcyon is another one that 
as non non benzo as well. A lot a lot of people like those. They're used in the hospitals a lot. So I like to go with the supplements, the natural things first, and then switch out and and do more heavy hitters, so to speak. But I like to actually choose a drug that causes the patient to have sedation as a side effect. And it's okay with me if that's if that drug is something that was originally started for a different reason, like uh, tizanidine, clonidine. We use a lot of clonidine for pain management. That causes a dry mouth and sedation also. The interesting thing, too, about clonidine is that it potentiates opioids. So part of the reason why people get more sedated on clonidine is because it's making their opioids stronger. Uh, the other medication that can be given, uh, I think, and works really well is carisoprodol or Soma. Uh, it's interesting that insurance companies won't reimburse for 250 milligram doses, but they'll they'll be perfectly happy to give you 350 milligrams. So normally we start at a low dose and go to a higher dose, but because hardly anybody prescribes the 250s, it's a, a lot more expensive. So I just skip right over them and go straight to the 350s these days for insurance to cover it. And it seems like they're pretty happy to do that. Um, if you take these things at the, at the right time and do a lot of other things uh, together with taking medications uh, by having a bedtime routine, then I think that those patients that do the same things over and over and over again at night are the ones that are really able to establish a sleep pattern that they never had before and to keep it. Um, and I think that once people start sleeping five to eight hours a night, you just see them come into the office and they're like bright eyed, their depression gets lifted their anxiety tends to be super relaxed. They're just not stuttering. They speak faster. They're, they have more clarity of thought. They don't stutter as much. They don't look as gray or as sad. A lot of people were like hunched over on benzos plus opioids in my experience. And uh, if that muscle relaxant, if the benzos were started for muscle relaxation and we can stop the spinal cord from overstimulating the muscles in the first place, then I think we do a really big service for our patients who, who need help in the spinal cord. Um, other drugs that may relax the spinal cord, if you have a, a, an injury or a pre compression on a, on a nerve would be baclofen. And usually that one doesn't have uh, sedation or dry mouth as a side effect. Uh, it's re really well tolerated. And for a lot of these medications, including baclofen, we start like at a really low dose of five milligrams and just take one tablet Monday, Wednesday, Friday for the first week. Uh, most people don't see a side effect at all. Then the second week, we take it every day, just once a day. And then, then the third and fourth weeks, you go uh, twice a day and then three times a day. So you take a full month to go up on a three times a day pattern. And then during the second and third months, we go from five to 10 to 20 milligrams three times a day if, ne if needed. And the patients are able to sleep really well with that too. And no side effects usually. So if... Uh, Tizanidine doesn't work, baclofen doesn't work. There's others like Lyrica, and we can, uh, I've, ne I've not had to go there yet or very often. It's a rarity. So, melatonin, magnesium, a sleep routine that's Pavlovian, and uh, keeping things away and out of your body that work against you seem to be the most effective things for most people. And uh, that is also something that we see is that the spouses, when they notice that their spouse is not up all night, that the spouses get better sleep too. And so that's, that's a win for a lot of people. Um, the other thing is that uh, melatonin has a lot of benefits besides just 
to sleep. There are melatonin receptors in your eyes, in your bone marrow, in your gut. And besides being something that causes sleep and helps the circadian rhythm, it's also a powerful antioxidant. So it's been used to treat um, eye health, especially age-related macular degeneration, uh, to treat stomach ulcers, uh, to even treat uh, ringing in the ears or tinnitus. And if you're a man and you take melatonin, it will actually increase your human growth hormone release at bedtime. If you eat a heavily sugared diet or a, a high carb dinner, though that, that high sugar content will decrease uh, melatonin and decrease human growth hormone too. So the other thing that it may help with is maintaining a normal body temperature. Some people seem to have like a revved up temperature, like a basal temperature rate that's like a low fever almost all the time, especially with lupus. So it may help body temperature. Um, and it could also help, uh, uh, the other thing I was going to say, the other things that disturb your melatonin levels include stress, of course, cigarettes, cigarettes mess up your melatonin, uh, blue light we talked about, not getting enough sun during the day or enough light during the day is something that people on the East Coast and Alaska really uh, work with with a lot, have trouble with. And so they have light bulbs to keep melatonin, uh, the pigmentation in your skin hitting that light so that it, it can function uh, properly. So it can not only help you get to sleep better, but also give you better quality of sleep and definitely is something that can be used for SAD or seasonal affective disorder, where it's cloudy or dark in the wintertime, and people get depressed from that. So, um, so it's also been helped in some cancers and traumatic brain injury, um, ringing of the ears, uh, ADHD, cerebral palsy. It can help uh, wean you off of benzos. It can also help bipolar and COPD. There's like a litany of diagnoses that, that melatonin has been helpful with, including migraines and chronic fatigue syndrome and osteoporosis and uh, heartburn and ulcers associated with H. pylori, uh, as well as uh, PCOS or polycystic ovary disease. And then we have another question. Love it asks, just do pain meds override sleeping meds or supplements? How do we counter that with our doctor? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think that it's the pain medications are something that you need to take so that you're not waking up with pain, right? So I think that that's going to be something that you need to take for your quality of life. Um, so pain meds don't really override sleeping meds because they're not meant to put you to sleep and you shouldn't be taking them, of course, to, to go to sleep. Those are to help you when you're awake or to like it help make your knife a little bit better when you're having a hard time sleeping because of your pain. So uh, that's, I prefer to go with your pain meds first, your normal pain meds that you would take, add magnesium, melatonin, actually even before that is the Pavlovian training. So you might want to eat a dinner a little earlier than usual. Go for a little walk after dinner or sit in your rocking chair and rock. Get away from the TV and your cell phone. Read a book. Have a cup of hot tea, hot green tea. Um, you also may want to um, just tone things down and keep, keep your life more simple because that could definitely have a big effect. And you can look through your house, look through your products, look through the things that you have and say, gosh, do I really need all this stuff? So what we're trying to do here is we're going to try to keep things simple 
keep the things that are worth holding on to and like look at the some of the things that other people have told us that we we have to have or that we need to have to be american or to feel complete we probably don't need a lot of the things that we have so i definitely think it's an opportunity to simplify your life keep grounded and that's another thing when you walk out to the garden barefooted or with some socks on you actually uh, ground yourself and you get rid of the extra electricity and nerve impulses that have accumulated in your in your spinal cord and any static electricity that you're uh, collecting as well, especially in this, the winter time when you've got the heater on a lot. So uh, it, it makes a big difference to get the cell phone away from your head at night. And then my next choice after the Pavlovian rituals that help you get ready for sleep is to do something to make the bed and the bedroom only for sleep and sex, pretty much. So you shouldn't have a TV in your bedroom. You shouldn't have a workstation in there. Of course, unless you don't have room and that's the only place you can put it. <laughs> so within reason, um, you don't want to be doing much of anything except for sleeping in bed. You want to wait till almost the last minute when you're in bed, which means if you're sick and you're bedridden, then of course you're going to spend a lot of time in bed. But whenever you can get out and sit in an armchair, sit in a, a rocking chair, sit on the couch, walk to the next room, that's going to help you in a lot of different ways. So um, there's there's a, a lot of theory that the that we're in bed too much and that when you wake up in the morning, that's another part of sleeping at night is awakening. So when you wake up, you want to get out of bed and get dressed and, or, you know, put your robe on, get out of bed, go to the next room. You don't want to wake up and spend two hours in bed. So that's like for average people. I know a lot of bedridden people who are super sick are in bed 99% of the time but you want to maybe try to get out of bed sometimes and lay on the couch instead go with the rest of the family go sit outside the weather's getting nicer now so make your awakening times uh, a time of activity as early as you can because even if you don't work I think it really helps to wake up in the morning Wash your face, brush your teeth, have a little something, you know, to eat and, and maybe develop a ritual where you keep a diary or you call a friend. Just do something that keeps you a little bit active and integrated with, uh, with your family and with the people around you. And uh, I want to just check and see if there's any... Uh, other questions? No, not yet. So that's good. Um, and uh, I think that if we can train ourselves to go ahead and have a routine, that's going to be a big thing. Um, uh, one quick second, I want to go back to uh, the slide that has the bottle of wine on it, or the glass of wine with the TV. Um, let's see, that's conditioning not to sleep. This is one I think that bears repeating because we don't even realize some of the things that we do that that sort of sabotage ourselves into not uh, sleeping well. So whether it's that glass of wine that you need to get rid of, the TV is a big one to get rid of, smoking cigarettes. I mean, a lot of people think that smoking relaxes them, but it doesn't. It, it's going to make your blood pressure and your heart rate both go up and act exactly like caffeine. It's going to activate your central nervous system. Um, so that's something that I think is pretty relatively easy to do. If you avoid heavy foods like pizza, don't eat something with a whole lot of fat in it because then you'll get heartburn when you lay down and that's going to work against you too. 
And then I think probably for people under 50, it's probably the hardest thing to stop uh, doing this, the television or the cell phone uh, at nighttime because a lot of people think it's really relaxing. Uh, there are a couple of things you can do, though. You can get some special sunglasses that block the blue light. You can buy those on Amazon for like 20 bucks, And at least then you won't be activating your central nervous system. Uh, the other thing I know on the iPhone, there's a, a special section in, this, in the phone light section that in the settings that allows you to do a yellow cover on it. That's how I have mine set. So uh, that's something that else that you can do if you really feel that the cell phone is relaxing to you, then either wear uh, glasses that block the blue light or set your cell phone to block the, the blue light because that's something that a lot of people do, um, don't realize even happens. And then Love It asks, lots of chronic pain patients are, ben are bedridden 24-7. Suggestions for sleep for us. Absolutely. So a lot of the same things apply. Get away from the TV. Get away from the cell phone. Wear, wear uh, blue light glasses, you know, blockers. Um, besides avoiding all of the, the negative things, uh, we can see that with Pavlovian sleep, getting in a rocking chair is a really good thing for some people to do. And you can even put your feet up on it and just like uh, kind of squat uh, on the rocking chair because it'll help your balance. It'll help your core strength. Um, and I know a lot of people that are bedridden cannot exercise whatsoever, but there are exercises that you can do in bed. And moving your body around and tiring out just a little bit is extremely helpful uh, for contributing to getting your body ready to sleep. Um, so you could, there in my first book that I wrote, I in the back section, I put a list of exercises you could do leg lifts, you could do arm lifts, you could get tomato cans, uh, tomato sauce, and use them for little weights. Um, anything that you do besides nothing is good for your body. And these days also, there are a lot of uh, yoga exercises that can be done from bed, and a lot of them just work against gravity. It doesn't require a whole lot of balance, but it, it does allow your bone strength to increase uh, because that's something that bedridden people really need to worry about is their bone density. You're not like jumping up and down and using weight-bearing exercises to keep your bones strong. And if you're on steroids plus bedridden, you're going to e be even more susceptible to osteopenia and osteoporosis. And why is that Why is that even important? Why is osteoporosis or osteopenia so important? It's because when you're older, when you're 65, if you're a man, and you're 65 or older, and you trip and fall and break a hip, fully one-third of those men will die in a year. So the time to get your bones strong isn't when you're 65, it's when you're 35, 25. Keep them strong. So uh, the same things that work for everybody else will work for people that are bedridden. You're just going to have to modify some exercise, avoid the same things that you're supposed to avoid, and then a lot of times the a bedtime bath will help with Epsom salts, which are magnesium. Those will relax your muscles too. So everything that you can do all in a row, the same sequence every night, keep adding something else to it if you need to. So you have maybe a routine of 10 things that you do three hours before bedtime. That's the kind of homework that it takes. And I'm sorry, it's not really easy. And Cindy asks, what do you think of using marijuana for sleep? Well, that's a, that's a good question. There, there's, I'll answer that in two ways. Because I'd like to talk about CBD. 
CBD does not, not have any THC in it or the tetrahydrocannabinol. It's not psychoactive. It doesn't make you high. CBD cuts inflammation. It can help a lot of people with sleep too. So the, I like that as a first choice. It won't show up as, as THC in a urine test, especially if you get a product that is pure, which we have to be careful of these days because a lot of supplement companies are under scrutiny for not putting supplements in their supplements. So again, I prefer the, uh, there's a liposomal CBD actually also that I like. And uh, it's from a really good manufacturer that does everything organic. So I think that's my number one choice in the marijuana department. Otherwise, uh, marijuana, there's uh, two main categories, sativas and indigos. So the sativas are pretty much for sleep. So yeah, a lot of people do that. I'm not opposed to it personally, um, because I think it's important to sleep. And there are so many benefits of sleeping that um, it, it, I think that it's it's worth an investment. It's one of the most, this is why the talk is right after diet. Listen, the, probably you spend more hours sleeping than doing anything else during the day, right? We spend like a third of our lives asleep. So you better try to do your best to make sure it's the best sleep that you can get because nobody's going to care about it as much as you are. So yeah, you want to grab at everything that you can to, to make sure. And, and Love It also asks, are there foods that help promote sleep? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there are some definitely some traditional things that help uh, get you to sleep. Warm milk. There are herbs. Uh, green tea uh, doesn't have the kind of caffeine source that regular coffee would have. But green tea, I think, is probably the most important antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, pain-reducing compound that you can put in your body at bedtime that will help promote your sleep because it will help your pain too because it's such a powerful anti-inflammatory and especially if you suffer from a spinal cord injury, a herniated disc, anything that's pressing on a, a nerve or a nerve root, uh, the great thing about green tea is that the compound in it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and can go into the brain and spinal cord areas of cerebral spinal fluid surrounding it. So uh, I love promoting green tea. About two years ago, they used to recommend uh, two to three cups a day. Now they're recommending five or six cups a day. And it's a, definitely a pleasurable entity to sit with your cup of tea with your daughter or with, you know, a girlfriend on the phone even and uh, sip your green tea at the, at the nice bedtime occasion and turn it into something lovely. The, the Brits have it on this one. A lot of other cultures, the Asian culture is really big on tea also. So I, I like that as a number one choice. And the warm milk is a good one too. Um, and then uh, I have another question on the name of my book. Well, the first book that I wrote, it was a very brain injured book. I ramble a lot in it. I thought I was going to die and I really just wanted to tell my family like what was happening to me and uh, that book is called No More Tears and the subtitle is A Physician Turned Patient Inspires Recovery. And I thought it was going to be my only book actually. I, I never really thought I'd write ones that after that I didn't really expect to live that long. That's pretty much why I wrote it. Um, I take you to the door of heaven with me. I had a near-death experience that was pretty, pretty real. Um, I think we have time to tell the story. I'll, I'll tell this one really quickly. Um, but uh, first, I'll say the names of my other books. So I, the No More Tears book, and then I wrote Stepping from the Edge to give you some biblical principles that I used as a Christian for helping me have faith and getting better. Uh, I wrote two books uh, revolving around my daughter, Little Missy Two Shoes Likes a Ladybug and Little Missy Two Shoes Goes to School. And I intended to write like 12 pack, like she goes to the dentist, she goes to the doctor, she does all these life change things that kids have trouble with. 
So I'm still working on that one. And then I wrote Archives of the Vagina, A Journey Through Time on Women's Health, because I thought I was going to die and my daughter wouldn't, she would have been raised without me, you know. So it starts with a, a girl's first period and goes all the way through hospice care and death and dying. And so uh, it's pretty comprehensive. And then my last book is uh, The Rebel Patient. It basically teaches you as a patient how to fight for your life, how to get your diagnoses, and uh, how to talk to doctors, how to answer their questions, how to be more of a professional patient. And I really, I really want all of my patients to read it. And I could tell who's read it and who hasn't read it. I'm like, you need to go read my book. You need to answer yes or no if I ask you a yes or no question. So uh, I'll tell you about my uh, near-death experience. Um, I was at a particular hospital I had gone to about 20 times before, and every time they saw me, they just rolled their eyes and didn't know what to do with me. They had put me around the corner in my own room by myself with no monitors. Um, And... I was really sick. Apparently, I was so sick that they called for a priest. So I remember the priest coming to my bed with his black suit and his white collar, and he had a little glass jar that looked like it had olive oil in it. And he just didn't even ask me anything or talk to me. He just came up to me, and he took that oil, and he put some of it on his thumb, and then I saw his thumb came to my forehead well as he almost touched my forehead I boom I was gone I was floating in outer space my feet were dangling um there was a big light to my left with energy pulsing from it like a low vibration noise the right was planet earth and straight ahead of me was a stairway to heaven with a big huge light everything blue white and the stairway went up and then it ended. And so this was God. The light was God. And he was talking to me without words. And I was talking back to him. It was all telepathy. And he said, go ahead and go. So I started going up the stairs. And I came to this top step. And I looked at where the line of this step ended. And it was outer space and clouds, a cloud in front of me. And so I remember turning back and saying, well, what happens if I go? And he said, you won't be able to come back. And it really bothered me because I wasn't ready to go. I wanted to come back and raise my daughter. I wanted to be with my family. And I just felt like I wasn't done with my job. So I begged. I begged God. And I, I felt really bad. Like, I felt like I wanted to sit under the chair. Like, I felt like I was like an inch tall. But I wanted to speak up for myself because it was such a big decision to make to go through that or to not go through it. So I said, well, I'm not ready. Is there any kind of way that you can take everything that I ever did, all the good things I did, all the extra time I spent with people, all the helping hands I gave, can you just make them all add up? Can you add them all up together and just make it good enough for me to go back? And the next thing I knew, this thumb coming off of my forehead, and it was the same priest that was standing right there, and that whole thing happened in like two seconds. So that did a lot for me, because when that happened to me, I realized that God sent me back and the rest of my life was something that he gave me as a gift. And then I just kind of figured out that he, I can't die now because he just gave me back my life. So I must be able to watch my daughter grow up and whatever age I am and whatever age she is, when I go, she'll be old enough to take it and she'll, be, she'll have known what her mom did after being in bed for 12 years and being too sick to stand up and take a shower, that I went back into medicine and had a practice and that miracles still happen. 
And I can't even imagine what she's learned from that and what more she has to learn ahead. So my last book is The Rebel Patient and my next two books are going to be The Chronic Life Diet and Trust Me Enough. Trust Me Enough is going to have all my recipes for spinal cord injury treatment. But the biggest recipe is trust and hope. So if I can get you to trust me enough to take the medications that I want you to take and to try these things that you may or may not agree with, and if your body responds to them, you're going to get better. And for most pain patients that I know, if your pain is a 9 or a 10 and we could get it down to a 7 or 8, that's progress. And it's, it's not unusual to have uh, patients that come in with a, a pain of 9 or 10 and have it go down to 2 to 3. So we want the best for everybody. And we keep finding the right combinations. And we keep trying. And a lot of people are getting better with anti-inflammatories, with sex hormone replacement, uh, supplements, good sleep good relationships there's a lot that goes into being healthy and uh, we, we try everything so there's, there, there's a magic formula it, it just doesn't fit everybody all the time and if it doesn't that's okay because we can we can find your magic formula and we'll keep looking until we do that's, that's a promise that I've made my patients, and that's what we're going to do. So um, don't forget, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have the uh, Don't Punish Pain Rally talk show with Claudia Mirandi. She'll be on with guest Angel Smithers. She's the wife of Dr. Joel Smithers, who recently got 20 years and is incarcerated now for prescribing pain medication for patients. So I want to thank you very, very much. Oh, and Cindy asks one more question I think we have time for. Did you feel incredible love during your NDE, my near-death experience? You know, I'll tell you what I felt. It wasn't incredible love, even though that was there. What, what hit me the most, and I describe it in my books for you, is the no more tears. Just imagine knowing that you're never going to cry again, you're never going to be sad, you're never going to have pain, you're never going to be lonely, you're not going to have all these negative, you know, suppressing emotions. It's gone. So, yeah, I felt incredible love, but it was also tempered. The big thing that I felt was peace. And I felt so much peace that I wanted to tell everybody, don't cry at my funeral, because I'm not going to be crying for you. I'm not going to be crying for anybody. I'm, I'm not going to be crying for anything. Just be happy for me, because I'll be happy. And I really don't want anybody to cry for me. So I want to thank you for joining us this evening here at Keeping You and the Family on COD360 Network for your daily dose of truth. I'm Dr. Margaret Aranda. Signing off for the evening and see you next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so very much and God bless you. Thanks for joining us for Keeping You in the Family. This program copyright 2019 by Dr. Margaret Aranda and Call 360. All rights reserved.